Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the central concepts that Friedrich Nietzsche discusses in essay number two of his Genealogy of Morals is this relationship between creditor and debtor and what it has to do with the origins of justice as well as a number of other things as well. And I do want to point out something at the very beginning. In carrying out this genealogy, Nietzsche is not, and so I want to emphasize this, not saying that the creditor-debtor relationship as understood in primitive times can be blown up as the template for everything else. That's not the way genealogical inquiry works. He's also not saying that it is the simple origin of all of these other developments. There are a number of contingent, um, you might call them additional elements that come in and then play a role. And it's not something that remains itself exactly the same thing in every circumstance. So we want to be careful not to turn this into something like a universal dynamic that explains everything. But it does play a really significant role in Nietzsche's view and even allows us to uh, get past some mistaken theories about matters. So the, the central question that he's really engaging with or a set of questions in essay two are the origins of guilt and guilt is going to play into what he calls the bad conscience right um, where punishment is deriving from and there's a whole discussion of that and then justice where is this conception of justice coming from and, and what what is it so one of the keys to this is this what he calls contract relations, for tags, for healthness, right? For health, for healthness is a relation between things, uh, like father and son is a relation, you know, in Aristotle's, um, you know, categories, he uses that as a prime example. Things that are relational are, you could say, defined or characterized or have their meaning with the other in their connection with the other. So without a creditor, no debtor. Without a debtor, no, no creditor. And when we see contract here in the text, we want to be a little bit careful. It's not as if everybody's sitting down and writing out a contract which would be governed by the norms of contracts of today where we say things like, well, if somebody doesn't know exactly what's in the contract, it's no longer binding. No, no, this is, we're talking about in the, in the past. People are making agreements, arrangements with each other. That may be a, another way of translating the fifth hogs in this. And we do want to talk a little bit about these terms creditor and debtor. As Nietzsche points out, uh, Schuldner, right, the debtor is the one who bears a schuld, a debt, but also guilt. And, and you know, these terms are connected with each other. The term creditor, we don't actually relate quite so well to its origin in Latin, right? Credere, um, to, to believe. And so creditor is one who extends credit to the other. In um, you know, German, it's actually Gläuber, right? So it has this sense of believing in what the other person has to say. And what are you believing in when you're engaging in credit, you know, we think of it in terms of money, but it could be all sorts of other matters as well. Any sort of tangible good that one person gives to another and the other promises, this is why they're believed, promises to pay back and may or may not pay back. Now, why is the promise 
believed in the first place. This is a good place for us to, to start, right? There's a promise of repayment or substitution, right? He says that, uh, here we go. Whence did this primival, deeply rooted, perhaps by now ineradicable idea draw its power? The idea of an equivalence between what? Injury and pain. I have divulged it as the contractual relationship between creditor and debtor, old as the idea of legal subjects, and in turn points back to the fundamental forms of buying, selling, barter, trade, and traffic. And he goes on and he says, when we contemplate these contractual relationships, we feel considerable suspicion and repugnance towards the men of the past who created or permitted them. And, and this is kind of an interesting side point. We'll look back on this and we're like, well, that's really unfair. Why would anyone enter into that? Well, because this is in the early stages of human development and they don't have any sort of blueprint to compare it against, like our own highly developed societies with their own highly refined notions of what counts as being a good creditor, being a good debtor, anything like that. At the beginning, like he says, the here we go, to inspire trust in his promise to repay, to provide a guarantee of the seriousness and sanctity of his promise, to impress repayment as a duty, an obligation on his own conscience, the debtor makes a, a contract or arrangement with the creditor. And they pledge that if they should fail to repay, they will substitute something else. What can they substitute? It could be money, right? But in a lot of cases, this is the creditor is giving money, and then the debtor has to come up with something else. So what else could it be? Something he possesses, something he has control over. For example, his body. People could actually sell themselves into slavery. Uh, we, we often forget when we think of the origins of Athenian democracy that one reason why <laughs> the democracy took hold is because the rich were in effect, you know, extending debts to, well, extending credit and then debts to the many and enslaving them uh, due to that. This is a very common experience all across societies that people fall into debt through this. His wife, right? Family members, his freedom, even his life, or given certain religious presuppositions, even bliss after death, the salvation of the soul, peace in the grave. And Nietzsche talks about Egypt here as, as an example of this, where the debtor's corpse found no peace from the creditor, even in the grave. Then he adds another thing. Above all, the creditor could inflict every kind of indignity and torture upon the body of the debtor. Uh, cutting off a, the proverbial pound of flesh, right? And so he talks about there being a strange equivalence here. He says, let's be clear as to the logic of this form of compensation. It is strange enough. An equivalence is provided by the creditors receiving in place of a literal compensation for an injury, thus in place of money, land, possessions of any kind, perhaps even food, a recompense in the form of a kind of pleasure. What is the what is the pleasure that they're allowed? The pleasure of cruelty. And he spends uh, several different um, you know subchapters in this essay talking about that. We're going to skim over that rather quickly, except to point out the central feature of this. What is this pleasure? Pleasure of being allowed to vent the power his power freely on one who is powerless. The, vol the voluptuous pleasure of doing bad for the pleasure of doing it. The enjoyment of violation. And he says the enjoyment will be the greater, the lower that the creditor stands in the social order. Or we might actually say the lower that the person is brought into the social order, right? Because uh, a debtor could, in fact, be among the powerful. And what is more, you know, delicious to, to the people of that time than to see enemies or, or debtors brought low and then treated as commoners? He goes on and he says, in punishing the debtor, the creditor participates in a right of the masters. So the creditor is allowed to take on the, the what, let's call it the, the mask, the position of the strong in this primary valuation and do whatever they want to do 
to the person who's placed in the weaker position, the common person, the person who's no good, who's you know, not measuring up to the debts that they have taken on. And so, like I said, there's a lot that Nietzsche says about that. We're going to skip over this. The main thing here is that there's this measuring going on. And uh, I'm going to skip ahead to that uh, section once we get past the cruelty and suffering part. So he says, to return to our investigation, this is in chapter 8, the feeling of guilt of personal obligation had its origin, as we saw, in the oldest and most primitive personal relationship, that between buyer and seller, creditor and debtor. It was here that one person first encountered another person, that one person first measured himself against another. Now, isn't that an interesting and peculiar thing for Nietzsche to say? We might, we might be tempted to say, well, wait a second, aren't there personal relations within the family? You know, father to, to child or, you know, parent to child or uh, husband to wife or you know, sister, brother to each other, extending it into cousins, and then we get these sort of clan-type structures. Nietzsche is, he's not denying that those exist, but he's saying that this is really where the true action is as far as the development of human culture, this relation between self and the other mediated in terms of objects and values, in terms of goods, in terms of debts. And he talks about the human being developing into the valuating animal, the animal that assigns values, Vieta. Um, so we've already seen this in the first essay with the primary valuation, the priestly valuation, the uh, trans valuation that consists in you know good and, and evil. Now we're talking about another kind of valuation that Nietzsche sees happening here. And he tells us that this is um, something that preoccupies the earliest thinking of human beings. He says, setting prices determining values, contriving equivalences, exchanging. You, you can find these in every grade of civilization. These preoccupied the earliest thinking of man to such a great extent that in a certain sense they constitute thinking as such. And we might consider that you know when we're looking at ancient literature, what is the earliest stuff that we have? We have myths. And then we have commercial transactions, don't we? You know, if we, if we think about the tablets from Mesopotamia, a lot of them are about business transactions, and some of them are about people complaining. Hey, you, you, you ripped me off on this deal. You didn't pay back in good measure after I paid out to you. So Nietzsche sees this as radically in, ingrained in our human nature. You know, you could say it's part of the development of human culture as such. He tells us, um, here the oldest kind of astuteness developed. Here did human pride, the feeling of superiority in relation to other animals, have its beginnings. Perhaps our word, mana, still expresses something of precisely this feeling of self-satisfaction. Man designated himself as the creature that measures values, evaluates, and measures, right? And so he says that buying and selling along with their psychological appurtenances, all these things connected with buying and selling, like being a creditor or a debtor, promising, right, are older even than the beginnings of any kind of social forms of organizations and alliances. And he tells us it was rather out of the most rudimentary form of personal legal rights that the budding sense of exchange, contract, guilt, right, obligation, settlement, first transferred itself to what? The coarsest and most elementary social complexes in their relations with other similar complexes. So now we have not just you know the strong and the weak in their dynamic and the priest emerging out of it. We have this entire domain that is interpenetrating that of, like you said, buying, selling, exchanging, valuing, making promises. All of those things are being combined with it. And this interpenetrates those primitive social complexes. He tells us that 
Um, the eye was now focused on this perspective, and with that blunt consistency characteristic of the thinking of primitive mankind, one arrived at the great generalization, everything has its price, all things can be paid for. That oldest and naivest moral canon of justice, the beginning of all good-naturedness, all fairness, all goodwill, that things can be exchanged for other things. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, is actually a fairly complex expression of this, right? Because it could be, you know, an eye for a blow. It could be whatever you want. Here we're actually going to get to the discussion of justice. So we've got a very interesting phenomenon here. Um, there's one other thing to point out before we talk about justice as such. So in chapter 9 and chapter 10, he talks about the member of the community being a debtor not only to other members of the community, but to the community itself, a notion that we find spread throughout uh, humanity. And that, um, why, why was that? Well, he says that one lives in a community, one enjoys the advantages of a communality, uh, one dwells protected, cared for, in peace and trustfulness without fear of certain injuries and hostile acts to which the man outside, the man without peace, is exposed. So being exiled, being set outside of the community means being vulnerable in many ways. Being a member of the community means being protected, being assured. And so if you break the mores, the rules, the laws of the community that you're already a debtor to, you're kind of a double debtor, Right? So he says, um, what will happen if this pledge is broken? The community, the disappointed creditor, will get what repayment it can. The direct harm caused by the culprit is a minor matter, right? So it, if you steal, I don't know, from the communal till, right, that's a bad thing. But the community also has to have recompense for the mere fact that you have violated the agreement, violated the norm. And it can impose an incredible heavy sanction at first. The lawbreaker, as he says, is a debtor who has not only failed to make good the advantages and advance payments bestowed on him, but actually attacked his creditor. Therefore, he's not only deprived of all these advantages and benefits, he is also reminded what these benefits are really worth. How is he reminded? By the wrath of the disappointed creditor, the community. Punishment, like he says, is simply a copy of the normal attitude towards a hated, disarmed, prostrated enemy who has lost not only every right and protection, but all hope of quarter as well. And then he talks about how later on within you know, the development of this, the community can actually afford to be very merciful, but we'll come to that in a moment. So let's talk about justice. Where does this idea of justice come from? We, we mentioned this already back in uh, the section, here we go, section 8 where he said, uh, the oldest and most naive, naivest moral canon of justice, the beginning of all good naturedness, right? And he says, justice on this elementary level is the goodwill among parties of approximately equal power to come to terms with one another, to reach an understanding, yet another relation, right? After the relation has been violated, justice means establishing a new relation, an understanding by means of a settlement. And there's another part to this, to compel parties of lesser power to reach a settlement among themselves. What is it that a judge is doing? A judge is reestablishing justice in some way. And oftentimes the judge has the power to say, not only to, to give a decision, but to take things away, to impose punishments. So justice is really not coming about from the weak. It's actually coming about from the strong who can impose, who can compel this settlement. And it winds up replacing the conflict and it winds up you know, changing the debtor relation. So how do we arrive at this self-overcoming of justice in mercy? This has to do with chapter 10. He talks about the community. As the power increases, a community ceases to take the individual's transgressions so seriously. 
Why? Because there's no longer such a danger that this is going to totally undermine society. So the punishments can become laxer and laxer. Mercy can afford to be shown. And like he says, the justice that began with everything is dischargeable, meaning every debt can be paid for. Everything must be discharged. Ends by winking and letting those incapable of discharging their debt go free. It ends as does every good thing on earth by overcoming itself, by transforming itself in the process. And he says, this self-overcoming of justice, we call this mercy. And it goes without saying, he says, that this mercy remains the privilege of the most power, powerful person or better, beyond his law. So it's not everybody who can show mercy in this respect. It's those who are powerful enough to engage in and, and to apply justice. He's also got this very interesting discussion where he's rejecting the ideas of during uh, about justice coming from reactive and resentment filled people that justice is really just a form of revenge. He says that we have to reject this. And he says, um, you know, some, some kinds of justice can actually be like that. And justice can certainly be harnessed by the reactionary, but where is it coming from in its origin? He says that, um, here we go, the, uh, the affects that are really driving justice are things like, you know, lust for power. And a little bit later in that section, he's got a reminder here of his fundamental point of view. He says, to speak of just or unjust in itself is senseless. In itself, no injury, assault, exploitation, destruction can be unjust because life operates essentially, that is, in its basic functions through injury, assault, exploitation, destruction, and cannot be thought of at all without this character. Um, legal conditions from a biological standpoint can no, be no other than exceptional conditions. They constitute a partial restriction of the will to life, which is bent upon power and are subordinate to its total goal as a single means, a means of creating greater units of power. So, I mean, this is Nietzsche's basic metaphysics of the will to power, um, but justice can play a role in that. When we have uh, a society in which the strong are going to jockey against each other and in which we've got this entire process dynamic of extending credit and debtors uh, not always paying things back, we have to have something that can restrain that reactivity, the cruelty, the, you might even say, one-sidedness of it. And here we go. Um, here's, here's the discussion that, that Nietzsche has of this. Um, he tells us that when we look at history, in what sphere has the entire administration of law hitherto been at home? The need for law. In the sphere of reactive people? No, it's the, that of the active, strong, spontaneous, aggressive. From a historical point of view, law represents on earth the struggle against the reactive feelings, the war conducted against them on the part of the active and aggressive powers who employed some of their strength to impose measure and bounds on the excesses of the reactive pathos and to compel it to come to terms. Wherever justice is practiced and maintained, we see a stronger power seeking a means of putting an end to the senseless raging of resentment under the weaker powers that stand under it, whether these are groups or individuals, partly by taking the object of resentment out of the hands of revenge, partly by substituting for revenge the struggle against enemies of peace and order, partly by devising and in some cases imposing settlements, partly by elevating certain equivalents for injuries into norms. And he says, the most decisive act, however, is that the supreme power performs and accomplishes against the predominance of grudges and rancor, it is the institution of law. Law starts to make things impersonal, right? A, a little bit earlier, he talks about this, and he says that um, 
Here we go. The last sphere to be conquered by the spirit of justice is the sphere of reactive feelings. When it really happens that the just man remains just, even towards those who have harmed him, and not merely cold, temperate, remote, indifferent, being just is always a positive attitude. When the exalted, clear objectivity is penetrating as it is mild, of the eye of justice and judging is not dimmed, even under the assault of personal injury, derision, and calumny, then this is a piece of perfection and supreme mastery on earth. Right? So what we, what we see here is a, a transformation that's taking place. Early on, we have this uh, creditor-debtor relation that is spread throughout all society that doesn't simply displace, but actually interfaces with the uh, modes of valuation that we were talking about in essay one. There's this transformation, and eventually we get a full-blown conception of justice, of right, pervading the society. And, and according to Nietzsche, nobody really grasps exactly how this, this complex dynamic uh, you know, developing over history is really happening, but it does trace back originally to this creditor debtor relationship that Nietzsche thinks is there in all societies that have managed any level of development.